Are we starting? So thank you everyone for joining. Um, we are going to record this meeting. So uh, if you are not happy to be seen or heard uh, for privacy reason, please leave the meeting now. Otherwise, uh, let's go. Okay, great. Thanks, Filippo. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Fashion Open Studio. Um, really, really thrilled this afternoon um, to have with us uh, Matthew Needham, who recently graduated from Central St. Martins with his MA uh, in fashion, um, uh, just literally about a week before the lockdown. Um, so it's a really nice opportunity today for him to be able to talk through some of his work. And he is joined by uh, some of his incredible collaborators uh, on the project, uh, who are the milliner, Joe Miller, uh, the uh, sneaker artist extraordinaire, Helen Kirkham, and Alice Potts, uh, whose work um, has been uh, in materials and she's been crystallizing sweat. You might have seen some of her work, um, but that's been put on hold uh, during coronavirus. Um, and we are really, really privileged to be joined today by Sarah Mower, who's going to be uh, talking to uh, the designers after the session. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Matthew. Uh, who's going to show you a presentation of uh, his collection, Oyeblik. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm very glad to be able to talk about this collection with amazing collaborators who I worked with over the last six months. Um, so I've just graduated from Central St. Martins um, in February, uh, just before the corona outbreak happened in Europe um, and yeah so basically the, um, the collection was about a period of time that once existed in my own life um, everything I make is upcycled and storytelling is an extremely important part of my process um, I'm a very process-based designer um, materials are very important to me I love found objects and working with found things and in 3D understand um, and this collection was really about those pieces. So each garment had a story to it. It was an artifact of the, the bigger picture. It was an artifact of the story. Um, and it was about the journey of these people and the journey that they took and visualizing, visualizing my own story, but in a more artistic way um, and working with these collaborators as well. So it was very important for me to um, share the story it wasn't about me it was about being able to utilize clothing to talk about more than the visual element of clothing um more than the material itself um so yeah the my work in the past um my ba collection was called man and his man made future it was a collection that i had done uh, about three or four years ago now at central st martin's as well um and this collection now was a sort of rebirth. Um, there was actually a book that I made alongside the collection as well, which explained the story and there was lots of words and um, it, was a, it was about that journey that I'd taken and it was a very personal element. So <clears throat> the whole collection began with an experiment called the wind machine. And it was almost like a time machine for myself. So I spent a lot of time in Norway between uh, the years of 2014 to 18 and utilizing these garments and these pieces that I wore when I was there in this wind machine that I created uh, was a way in which I could transport myself back. It was about looking at that period of time and um, finding a visual representation of it. So this structure is, uh, it's made of like a like dust sheets, uh, plastic, and it was filled with wind. And I couldn't see what was happening while so experimenting. So the photography would just sort of, the sorry, the camera would just sort of flash and it would just be in a moment of me putting something on really fast. And the silhouettes and the start of objects came from this experiment. Um, this was actually a photo shoot that I did with um, a friend called Harry Bradbury. 
uh, when the collection was finished. So it was important that I highlighted each piece for me. Um, each of the garments has a sort of a label or a, an explanation of where it came from. Um, pieces like the fishing jacket, for example, or the duvet dress, um, they all come from different places. They have different materials. Some of it's dead stock from industry. So uh, Sarah was actually kind of to put me in contact with Alexander McQueen, who kind of donates a lot of fabric to the project. Um, and there was pieces like uh, created from ship sales, um, uh, organic jerseys, the organic jersey company, uh, organic carton company, sorry, gave me a lot of jersey, uh, which was great. And a lot of things came from Bernardo's as well, which is a, a charity that I work with quite a lot. Um, yeah. And the name Oyablik actually, um, it means in the blink of an eye. So it's a Norwegian word that doesn't necessarily have a direct word translation to English. Um, and it was very funny because it came about so organically, like a lot of the pieces did. I was um, at university at St. Martin's and I saw this guy and I kept seeing him all the time at school. And um, I just had this feeling that I needed to ask him to model or something like that. And it turns out that he's from the place that I went to in Norway and uh, his name is Morgan and he modeled in the collection. And he, when we did a fitting, he had this tattoo on his leg, which is actually the tattoo you see in the image now. And I asked him what it meant. And he said, you need, you need to go and look what it means. And he said, it means in the blink of an eye. Um, and I was like, that's exactly what the collection is. It's just very strange. So that's when we kind of started this process and that's where it all began. But um, yeah, so I'll, I'll pass over to Helen. So Helen Kirkham, Helen, we met like, what, like four years ago, five years ago? It was just after BA, I think. And uh, I started working with Fashion Revolution then, who introduced me to Helen. And uh, I've always admired her work and we've always wanted to work together. <laughs> it was just kind of a, it was a, a blessing that we managed to do it. No, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Matthew, for organising this discussion because it's I've really got a thousand lovely. things going on at the same time. <laughs> Literally, that's people to get in the room. <laughs> um, it's really, really lovely for us to be able to talk about the collection. And I think exactly as Matthew said, you know, this really did become a collaboration between all of us, um, which was really lovely experience. Um, but if you don't know who I am, I'm a footwear designer and artist. I'm based in London. And I mostly make sneakers out of recycled products. So I collect sneakers from recycling centers, break them down to their component pieces, make them into new shoes, basically. Um, so for this collection, obviously I wanted to have the same sort of mantra as I usually follow, um, but Matthew had some quite specific requests um, <laughs> that were, you know, very unusual and pushing me a lot out of my comfort zone, which was so exciting. So, um, <clears throat> Firstly, when he approached me to do the project, I actually didn't really have time and um, was stressing over other things. Um, but I kind of, you know, evaluated it all and realized that, you know, this project isn't just about making objects. It was about creating a community together. And it was about creating a project of, you know, a collection of items that we believed in and that we felt were important and kind of transcendent of objects themselves into something else. So, you know, I found time and uh, we made nine pairs. Yeah. Um, so a couple of the requests were obviously um, because of Matthew's uh, interest in the project with looking at Norway, looking at a lot of this sort of idea of journeys and hiking and um, kind of self-expression. We were really interested in these five finger shoes from Vibram. So it's an amazing um, kind of climbing or hiking shoe um or you know barefoot running kind of shoe that they use uh, and we contacted them and they, they actually said, used to wear them when i was there yeah I remember. originally isn't it and i sort of mentioned to you and you were like wait i know someone there and we, it's how it kind of started it's really organic yeah exactly so it meant a lot to you so we reached out to them and said look do you have any dead stock that you could send us over that we could we could work with um, so they sent us a few pairs, you know, various colours and, and sizes, and we used those as the raw materials to kind of create the collection. And then as well as that, we had Sarah Moa's fantastic um, <laughs> heels. So Sarah obviously is quite connected to this project because you sent us uh, a few pairs of your old heels that we 
actually upcycled as well. And um, it was so interesting for me because I never worked with heels before and especially not your heels. So it was very, um, you know, it was a bit stressful, but um, it was really, really exciting to, to try and apply my techniques to, um, to those shoes. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so you can see here the kind of techniques that we started to look at. So the first thing I needed to do was build um, a pattern, which is the same as I do when I make my own sneakers. And with my shoes, the left and the right are always different because I'm using recycled products. Quite often, I can't make the pairs the same. So you can see the left hand image there is two uppers from the same pair of shoes, but actually they have different pieces. And you can see we used like there, there's a Euro hike um, tent bag. We've got bits of high vis jackets. We've got suitcases, we've got recycled sneakers. So it really was an amalgamation of both of our ideologies together. This idea of journey, this idea of stories all embedded into these products. Um, then with the soles, we really wanted to try and add a bit more of a dynamic feel to these um, kind of barefoot and very low profile shoes. So we started adding these chunky running um, silhouette sneaker kind of heel patches. And we, we wanted to still make that organic, still make that fit with the, um, the feeling of the collection, but give it a little bit of oomph and um, make them a little bit aggressive and also fit with this sort of sneaker culture that obviously I'm quite known for working within. And then finally, onto the heels, um, we, you know, we had these toes and we really wanted to create something quite unusual and a little bit unexpected. So we looked at if we could actually merge the five finger shoes with the heels from Sarah and started creating these very kind of unusual silhouettes that became a little bit alien, a little bit um, kind of disturbing in a way to look at. But we wanted to create this these pieces that worked well within the collection and weren't screaming for attention, but that were kind of bringing the story together, um, which is why we ended up including rocks as well in the heels. I think you can see on the next slide. Yeah, so we actually, Matthew brought some rocks from Norway. It wasn't me, it was uh, Morgan, the guy who was modeling for me, yeah. He bought the, the rocks yeah, um, and then we embedded them into the design as well. And we really wanted to create these kind of organic pieces that my work, people often say, is a bit Frankenstein, or has that sort of aesthetic. So these sort of like organic creations that felt like they were at home within the collection. Um, and this is just three examples of the different silhouettes that we ended up um, creating. And I remember as well on that black um, high top, at the top there, I don't know if you can see right at the top of the collar, there's like a little label and it was um, a high tech sneaker, like a kid's sneaker. And it was the inside tongue and it had a little thing that said name. And right at the last minute when I finished the shoe, I was like, oh, I'm going to write oil blick on there. <laughs> and I, I remember using the piece and I was like, I really don't want to use this piece because it's one of my favorite pieces. And then I thought I'll write the name of the collection and it makes it meaningful. So you're lucky to have that piece on there. Um, and that was it really. And that was kind of how we, um, we worked on the collection. Uh, anything else you want to add, Matthew? Um, no, I think you, you nailed it. Yeah, I think oh. it was, yeah, I, I knew in the beginning that I, I just liked this idea of the toes because it, it just was so reminiscent for me of that time period. Mm. Um, and this idea of journey and walking and everything. But um, yeah, it was just great to work with, with Helen. Yeah, it was so nice to work together. And it was really, again, this idea that we we kind of started off the project together. You know, I came in quite okay. early. So, um, even though I didn't do anything for a long time and just like faffed around, I was in the process of, you know, all your thoughts and everything like that. So I think it was it was really nice to to be included in that process. Quite often as a footwear designer, people come to you right at the end and they're like, oh, can you do me some shoes? And it doesn't really work like that. So it was so nice to work in such a collaborative and open way. And also for Vibram, obviously, for giving us the five finger shoes. So uh, we managed to get these quite dynamic and unusual results. There's nine pairs altogether, which I think you can see on Matthew's Instagram or my Instagram. Um, so you can see all the different varieties. Yeah. Thanks so much. I enjoy it.
you're on mute, I think, Joe. There you go. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Again, thank you, Matthew, for the opportunity to speak about your work, which is a really rare opportunity as a milliner. Um, I was really keen to do this collaboration with Matthew for quite a few reasons. Um, we're both very material and process driven and there's like natural synergies with our work and like past projects that we've done uh, separately. Um, you can see the connections with our, our work. Um, I'm a milliner who only works in fashion. I don't do any occasion wear. I have my own studio and I'm very material and process developed and I, I push a lot of like materials through process which takes a lot of time. Um, and I wanted to work with Matthew in that way. It's quite often in fashion, it's, it's very common for a milliner, same as what Helen just said with the shoes, to come in right at the end of the process. And the garments are already like pretty much like there. They have an idea of like the headpiece that they want and you interpret and make. So you, it's quite often for mil common for a milliner to be a maker. I was very excited about working with Matthew because it, we wanted to challenge that notion and to see what we could do. Um, we didn't actually know what we were going to do and it was very open from the beginning. And I, like Helen, I was there from the beginning. Um, and from the beginning, like I was involved in processes like Matthew was going off to Bernardo's and collecting materials and I went along with him. And we worked together sort of a backwards and forwards process um, which was it, which was long and it, for a lot of time wasn't quite sure what was working. It was like open. Um, if you go to the next slide, can you go to can you, can you go to the next slide? It should be on the next slide now. Cool. Um, in the middle slide of those pictures, you can see Matthew on one of his many visits to my studio. Um, which of there was many where he shared his research, we shared our ideas, we shared lots of um, things. The piece that he's wearing was what I was working on in my own work at the time. It, I was working on a collection where I was working with the ideas of inflation, I was working with balloons, but I was working with pushing them through processes and crushing them and making them into other materials and denting them and just working very much with process. At that time, Matthew um, found that the balloon was very significant in his con in his concept for his collection as a whole, and it kept it was something that kept reoccurring in his research material that we kept working with. So it was like an obvious thing to take forward, which is where the balloon kind of came from. Um, initially, um, Matthew was very keen for it to be glass, glass like. Um, so initially we did explore the idea of it being in glass, which would have been a preference for us both, but we had to work within the limitations, time limitations, budget limitations, and just what was feasible and realistic, which is often the case when you work in a collaboration to just be realistic, um, as well as pushing your boundaries. So we, ex we explored the processes that I was already working with, but Matthew challenged me to push them. He, he wanted these very, um, although I was crushing and denting my materials, he wanted them to go very much into saggy processes, which was a whole new thing for me. I had no idea how I was going to do it. So it opened up this world where I could explore working with um, the balloons. We, we worked with much bigger balloons. We eventually ended up working with sex balloons, which were much bigger because they had much more um, flexibility in their shape. Um, and I worked a lot on how to use use that and to distort the shapes to create different forms. So like, I worked with weights and clamps and ropes and a lot of the early materials we collected from Bernardo's, I kept going back to those and using them as like presses and impresses in the process and like the ropes, like the sash window cord, which was key for Matthew in his collection kept, you know, those little elements kept coming through. We went through many things that you don't see in the final products. We considered at one point they were under underneath the garments. And as Matthew went through his process of like, obviously his garments kept evolving and bits going and bits coming and developing through as they do naturally. And that kind of like happened with like the headwear, like kind of 
is this relevant still is this not relevant at one point i was working i was going to be working with the stones from norway same as helen but then they didn't make it into the final piece we went through many 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 parts which was like such a, a privilege really that's kind of like why i found time myself because i was busy in balancing other projects same as helen to kind of go through this um process which will have integrity as kind of like a design process so we came we came to in the end so we looked at um we looked at about five different specific forms that i worked on but in the end we ended up with like the one headpiece which was like the saggy glass balloon and then like a handheld piece which was very reflective of the process that i worked because i ended up working quite a lot with uh, water in my process um which then became part of the piece in the water held piece the piece that you can see on the left is an overpour which was done at um dsm when um me and matthew were putting together a, a like a plinth that was in the show of the process that i was using and we did an overpour of like the resin and it went on the floor and matthew picked it up loved it and wanted it <laughs> wanted it in Very the lovely. show like on the morning <laughs> of the show and was like joe like you know so what you know yeah, so that's a really good example of kind of like very like how something um, the two people coming together create something more. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to add anything, Matthew? I'm just thinking. Yeah, because I mean, I lo always loved Joe's work, like even before I knew Joe, and we met like when did we? We met, I think, through Leo Carlton, didn't we? Yeah, we were, yeah. But I think that, like, the stylist uh, Pierre, the stylist Pierre Alexander Fuller put our work together in a shoot because, like, oh. yeah, I was doing work where I was taking um, things off the street. I was taking raw materials off the street and pushing them through process to turn them into a new material that looked very luxury. And, and so was, was I. Out. Yeah, which was very much for me about alchemy at the time, like sort of like alchemy of the everyday and questioning. I very much question material and kind of like our understanding of like luxury and material. So I often mix things up in, in, in that kind of way, which that is a natural crossover in the work that Matthew does with his upcycling. Hi Alice. Hi. Um, yeah, so um, do you want to go? You go. Um, yeah, so I actually think I met Matthew last out of everyone. So I met Matthew in Greece, Greece. <laughs> <laughs> well travelled, um, two years ago where we sort of like almost automatically connected. But I think coming from like a whole new realm of like bio design and new materials, we had always sort of discussed about collaborating, but was trying to find a way that we could really sort of work together and I think Matthew contacted me around sort of November of 2019 where he actually came up to me and asked if it was possible to make crystals from tears and I think as you can sort of see in the picture the beauty of the cheering that we made was something completely unique to him and something very intricate and exciting and I'd never sort of previously had worked with that having only done sweat before and to create something that really sort of embodied the emotion of him through this journey was like so exciting and so new and I think that's why I personally felt so connected with this is that there's a lot of things that maybe you don't see about the journey through the sort of fashion collection and to be able to make a piece that resembled his journey through that to the final show was something that I as well felt super honoured that I could also be part of that and um, I think the beauty of the touring as well was that it's fully biodegradable so it's not something that will always last forever but resembles this collection in such a way. I think I'd previously been researching the ideas of tears for the last two years, having discovered that there was 
every sort of emotion you have creates like a different structure under a microscope in terms of response to like love, joy, sadness, and like the overall development for me and Matthew took five to six months. I think the first two to three months were Matthew carrying a sterile container, <laughs> specifically mastering the art of actually catching his own sweat, which I don't know how his housemates would have feel, but refrigerating it every time in between so that it wouldn't sort of distill off. Me and, I think, <laughs> and I think what was so exciting and also sort of very nerve wracking was we didn't really have a piece together till almost two weeks beforehand because it was something that I hadn't experimented with before but tears are made of mineral compounds very much like sweat so we sort of kept in contact throughout the whole the whole process of it like looking at how we control all these different factors and how it would react and how we would create something and I think one of the sort of main things was that it created these like two very very beautiful crystals and the structure and the shape are completely completely unique to Matthew and on sort of the previous slide was sort of a technical imagery by Morse Micas which is photos of tears under a microscope you can sort of see how everything changes from the first image of someone's tears from eating a red pepper someone's in the middle from cutting an onion and tears from joy as well, which we didn't sort of specifically control this factor of the collection. So we were sort of collecting every tear of the journey. And like, I think that's what's so exciting is that these two crystals could be completely two different identities of emotion, which have formed separately. But I think just being able to be part of that in a different way and have this like whole resemblance of this moment was like a really exciting factor. Yeah, I think if I, um, what blew my mind was the fact that like, as you just explained that when you cry, when you're happy or when you're sad or for whatever reason, the tears are different and they have a different molecular structure. And the possibility of embodying an emotion inside an object that you can wear was mind blowing to me. It's like, it's beyond imitating it, like in a silhouette or, you know, through the way it looks, for example, it's literally the emotion it, from your body, which I just find was amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm glad we, we managed to do that. I think that's what was so like, I think I felt like, cause obviously like I've known you only for sort of like two years now, but we've connected so much. And I think it's so hard to always have the time and connect with people. And there's such like a big support group that I think people sometimes don't realize, especially within sustainability and recycling and upcycling. And I like generally without being a bit sloppy, I couldn't have asked for like a better opportunity and a better collection to try this whole experience experiment out with and I think it made something designed by you as well like something so beautiful and so intricate that yeah I'm glad I could have been part of it. Oh that's yeah. Sarah can't unmute herself. Here I am. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm um, I've got at least two hats. One of them is I'm an ambassador for emerging talent for the British Fashion Council, which is how I know everybody except except Joe so far. So hi, hi, Joe. Um, and I'm also chief critic for um, Vogue Runway. And I've known Matt since 2016 because yeah. we're a scholar for, um, who had a, um, a scholarship for, from the British Fashion Council Education Foundation. Um, 
And I was just thinking back to those those uh, four years ago. Actually, I knew Helen before that because you. When did you graduate from the Royal College of Art? Two thousand sixteen as well. Oh, so, same year. Yeah. Um, and that very very yeah, beginning yeah. of young designers um, using these words, um, you know, upcycling and and um, being not wanting to damage the environment and finding new new strategies, new ways of being creative with it. I mean, really, um, in those four years, so much has changed. Um, I mean, do you feel that, Matthew, that that I think at the beginning you were <coughs> you were very fixed on this path, but also you it felt like you were an outlier and you were an outlier. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> Helen, that you were breaking new ground here. Um, if I, if, so I'll go first. Um, yeah, I mean, at that time, it was around, well, you, uh, yeah, so around 2015 <laughs> was when I, sorry, Sarah, is she okay? Um, yeah, around 2016 was when um, I met Sarah because I was starting to do my final collection at Central St. Martins for BA. And it was a time when I was going to Norway a lot and it really changed the way I talk about Norway because it had changed the way that I saw the world. I'd never seen the world like that before. I'd never seen mountains or the sea like that. It, it was just a totally different way of living and thinking. And the people there had such a different mindset to people who live in the city. Um, and so in that collection, I, I did use a lot of materials that I'd found there on the beach or um, you know, in the street of London and combined it with, you know, dead stock from Chanel and things like that. And it was, it was where all this process began. I didn't know I was upcycling. I just knew that I loved old things and I loved storytelling and I loved the story behind those materials that then I, you know, managed to give a, a new life. I had the opportunity to give a new life to. Um, but yeah, in the last three years, um, especially, it's just grown so much like the conversation that we can have with any student at a university you mentioned the word sustainability and I'm sure they have so much to talk about and their own opinion on it as well it's not just um you know words that are thrown around um there is a lot of greenwashing and stuff still happening obviously we all know that but at the same time I think there are leaps and bounds and people are really you know making their own opinions and decisions and making practical uh, changes to the way that they work um bioscience as well like i I, th I mean i only was introduced to bioscience a couple of years ago when i found alice's work and then since then like me and sarah have had conversations about it and we went to a place in shepherd's bush sarah as well you showed me that um that sort of lab there as well it was uh, amazing and i think it is uh, such a part of our future in design you know Um, but yeah, also from my, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Um, from my perspective as well, just to add on to exactly what you said, like when Sarah kind of first saw my work in 2016, I had, you know, I started that project 2015, which is five years ago now, which is absolutely crazy how quick that's gone. Um, but, you know, at that point, I had so many conversations with tutors and technicians asking me, well, how are you going to commercialize this? How are you going to, you know, I was so interested in the story of the pieces, exactly the same as you. I was interested in, you know, these discarded sneakers that are thrown away and they embed so many stories and memories and human agency within the product that that is what the beauty is it's not about replicating that and so when i was creating my collection i had so much back and forth like oh yeah but you're not gonna be able to sell that people aren't going to want to buy old pe people's old shoes and you know and i think now in the the time the the four-ish years that i've you know been in industry come out of industry tried to set myself up and now i'm looking at what i'm doing as a real business i've started to realize that this is a very tangible way forward and it is something that people are looking for and I think like all of us we're all driven through process and we're all driven through stories and you know the fact that we managed to stay true to those things and to kind of bring those things to the 
to the surface, I think is only elevating um, what we can do now. I think people are just at a stage in life where we don't want to be lied to. We, we want more than just clothes. We want more than what the clothes look like. You know, people want to know where their clothes came from and what they're made from, you know, and why they exist. And it's not just about the visual that fashion always has been about, you know, it's about more. I think than we've been like given such, like all of us. And I think what makes us all work together so well as well is that I think the way that we all view and the way that we all develop our work is that we see fashion as maybe not so commercial in the sense that it's mass produced but we're able to sort of connect something and create stuff which shows fashion as a memory shows fashion as something which is part of us something which is a journey from a to b a moment in our life and showing that actually sustainability isn't just a message but it's actually a, a look almost and it's something which actually makes every item completely unique to us as an individual through the way we wear it through the amount of times we step in it from the fact that every time we also wear it part of our body becomes into it and how our body actually makes these fashion pieces come alive and I think the same sort of with Helen's work is that the more someone wears it the more story it has the more character it has and I think Matthew did an amazing job of bringing all of us together and I think it's these sort of conversations that more students are having and the fact that working together makes us all stronger and supporting each other is what has been like a big change in the last couple of years. Am I still on this? I can't see anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, go for it, Sarah. My visible, I'm good. <laughs> um, it seems to me that you're all you're all working on a completely um, different way of 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 um, creating a, a aesthetics. Um, I mean, before if if you actually said um, five or ten years ago, there's going to be a generation of people working with bodily fluids with um, rubbish um, with with completely taboo and kind of um, revolting to many people, ideas of this materiality. That's so interesting. I mean, I love what um, Joe said about the alchemy of the everyday. And also, um, Alice, you said to me in the past, that something that's really stuck in my mind is that you're, you're working with what's here, with what's already here. You don't feel you're against the idea of going to um, buy something in a linear way. I mean, this is something that I think all of you have in common and not a lot of uh, young students and new designers do. Can you, can, can you talk to me about that, about the aesthetics of it? Because something has to be transformed into something beautiful, doesn't it? Beautiful and, and new in a way. I think what I can say like, from having met all these guys now is that I think Sustainability has never almost been a choice, but has been a work ethic from the way that we produce our work. And I think that's what has made everything so sustainable in a way where we haven't, like, it hasn't been something which we have felt forced to do, but it's been something that we've generally been interested in. And I think there's this idea that it has to be fast paced and something which has to fit in right now but I think because we started so much earlier and we stuck to what we believe in I think it can be hard and I don't think any of us can say it's been an easy journey but I think by staying as true as we can to what we believe in and by using the resources around us I think what I say to like most people as well is that just going outside and seeing the world like seeing all the materials around you and not just seeing a fabric shop and seeing fabrics there but like nature is fabric these objects are fabrics and the more we use them the more we touch them and the more we see color i think the more we can start opening our mind up to the possibilities of what fashion is and what fashion could be yeah totally i think for me like in my previous work it was so much more about 
showcasing the trash. So it was like using the trash as it existed, you know, embroidering it as if it was jewels or something from Swarovski, but, you know, highlighting it in that um, essence. But now it's it's different because it, it's embedded in the garments and it's embedded in the process and the storytelling and it doesn't need to be so obvious anymore. And I think people expect it and they they want to look for it. And that, yeah, it doesn't need to be on the It's not decorative. It's embedded and it's embodied in the object. It exists because of that. I, I wanted to say something else though. I was really impressed by uh, your show notes. Uh, I mean, normally show, I'm a fashion show handout and it's, all about the concept um but what was really family ah sorry phone's going down um which was so um progressive pro progressive your about your show notes was you, you had the provenance of every single um garment um listed in a very sh short form very um very digestible very easy to to understand and um I think that that's that's something that kind of, that communication is is so is so important in in your work and for for young designers going forward. Um, well, every designer is going forward because um, when we buy things now, uh, we want to know where they come from. So, could, can you can you talk to to us about um, about that documentation? Sure. And how how difficult it is to get it into those few words because I, I appreciate that as a writer. Yeah, for sure. I remember that you saw one of the lineups and I had the descriptions underneath and that's kind of where the idea came from. Because um, I had this problem with explaining it to, because fashion is something that's usually digested in a split second, so like in a runway or, you know, just in an image. But it was really important for me that the clothing wasn't just taken at face value, but you understood everything behind it. So to describe each garment in a really short sentence and giving it a name like the green hoodie or the suitcase bag you know it became an object of antiquity in itself and basically the the show notes there were small photographs um, and cutouts and they had different descriptions around them so the idea was that when you looked at the the notes you could kind of see the garments and you could know what they were and read about them in real time so we actually presented um, before the runway show um, at St Martin's this year, it was in a presentation format. Um, so the models came on and they kind of interacted with each other and they stood there in the space. So as people were walking in and people were sitting down, they could go up and they could look at the garments and see these people and um, really interact with the garments. I think, yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, I I also think it's a, it's it's you won't realise this because you're so young and um, you know designers don't you don't have necessarily been to many designer sh uh, shows perhaps not perhaps you haven't um, but I think it sets an example to to all designers that's this is what as journalists now we want to we want to know uh, because more and more when you're when you're going to fashion shows um, you kind of start to cringe if you see plastic or some, it may not be plastic, it might be latex, you know, which would be a, you know, perhaps a viable and sustainable um, source. But the questions now um, that that people are asking, the more we, the more we know about where, where the, you know, the, da the, the damage that's done to, to the environment by, um, by the sourcing of fabrics, the more we, we need to know, I mean, where things come from. And I think that's you know something that your generation is is leading the, the way in, um, and also I mean with 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 biotech tech bio bio design that's that's even even more important. Um, I mean Alice, you've you've documented your work very 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 thoroughly, haven't you? Is that is that sort of a, a parallel responsibility that you find that you that you have with your work? I think it's trying to, like, I document everything and try and keep it as open source as possible because I mm. feel I was very lucky being introduced to bio materials four or five years ago with Helena and Tom, who now own Open Cell in Shepherd's Bush. 
and I think without the support of them I would have never really had the encouragement to go into bio and learnt so in depth about the idea of using biology in either mimicry or as a base of sort of materials but I think that's why I also focus on the material element and then instead of just making products because I think the collaboration is so important whether it is with a designer, an architect, um, a scientist and I think by showing people that things like this are achievable even if you don't have a degree in science but just allowing your imagination and allowing people to outreach to people who they wouldn't normally feel comfortable to I think that's what I've always sort of pushed is allowing these conversations to happen but also to educate people about what biodesign is and what biomaterials are and Helen yes Helen Hi, sorry, I can't, can't see oh, on, my, on my stupid phone. Um, uh, when when you went into industry, you you were snapped up immediately. Yeah, because the, the look your 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 sneakers is so original um, at university that you're immediately taken into industry. But did you find that industry could actually use what you have and what you are? I think that was such an interesting um, experience for me because it was really, um, you know, I came straight from RCA, which was so creative and you're so encouraged to you know, do whatever you want and you get in this real um, crazy mindset and you just go deep down a rabbit hole of exactly what you want to do. And then I came straight out of there and uh, went to work at Adidas. So obviously I was so fortunate to be off the job straight out of my MA. And I had a lot of friends around me, you know, that were maybe going into unpaid internships or these different things of their MA. And I was like, that is ludicrous. So for, for me to be offered a job, obviously so amazing. Um, but then what I found in that year was my work got picked up by so many other brands as an inspiration, to say the least. Um, and that became a really kind of point of turmoil for me because I was working in this industry that I was really interested in and I was learning a lot. But then I was watching my collection get kind of extracted by other brands and I, I didn't know what to do about it. So, so in the end, that's why I decided to um, leave, basically. I just thought, you know, I've, I've put this idea into the world and people seem to be interested in it. So I'm gonna try and set up my studio and put some gravitas behind it and be, be the sort of face of what my work is and show that, you know, I'm not just a student that graduated and you can take my work I'm gonna be more than that so um, it was it was definitely a real real kind of point of turmoil but um, I think that the one thing that I found which I thought was so lovely was that like all of us kind of said you know our work is about the process and it's about the found objects and pieces you know the materiality and the tangibility of those of those things and it's not about replicating that so, so the fact that I managed to stick to my guns when I was at RCA and really make the products out of the old shoes and not copy or replicate it was the one thing that I could hold on to when everything else kind of blew up around me and know that that's what made my work, you know, something important, I suppose. So, and I think that's, you know, we all kind of have that in common, that idea of um, holding on to like the, the real importance and the relevance of our work and not straying from that, which, um, which is quite nice to hold on to when everything else goes sideways. <laughs> but, now, but, now you, but now you're making bespoke shoes that you have a service now where, where people can send in their, a bunch of their old, their old dead trainers and you'll make them into a new pet. Um, so, I think that's a really interesting way forward for for your generation to make to make things specifically for for the person. You've you've done that as well, Alice, haven't you? I you've made jewelry. 
I think that's what's so much nicer about, especially sort of like looking at the idea of sustainability and biodesign and recycling is that I think for all of us, fashion has so much more of an importance than just something we wear. And I think being able to work with an individual, whether it's a customer or another designer, and like being able to work with them in making something so personal has made it so much more meaningful, as well, especially with like what the product is. And I think all of us can sort of vouch with the way that that process works is just so much nicer instead of working almost behind the scenes in a sort of commercial setting. I think for me as well, because I so I've started to be made to order as well. And I think the idea of the story um, coming from someone else. So, you know, if someone comes to you and they want a specific piece or a specific garment, we can start to create a story together and the materials create the story for me and that's why the garments exist. So it kind of starts this whole process um, and it's not just from sketching on a, a piece of paper, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's exactly the same for me. Like if somebody gives me five pairs of their old shoes, then I can see that you know the toe is scuffed and they have a memory of you know falling over in a nightclub or whatever and that's how they stuff their toe and, <laughs> yeah. and I can take that toe cap and I can put it somewhere so prominent and it becomes the kind of whole story of the piece and I think I it's a question I get a lot as well you know oh do you do do you sketch first or do you do this and that and really until I have like the products in my hands I have no idea what the shoe's going to look like and I think that's something that's so beautiful about it really it's all about the the process of making and that's something that that other people can't take away from us i think sort of copying with what helen said i think when you work in fashion you're so used to designing knowing exactly what your final outcome is working so hard on getting that outcome that i think all of us found a way that actually we could sort of really get excited about fashion and not have like an idea of what we're going to make or what we're going to produce but allow the material, the people, the environment, all to sort of lead us to a journey of like this unknown, which is like super exciting. And I think we can all say that we've had fails along the way. And I think that's part of the journey, but yeah. It's about listening to materials. It really is. It's like when I'm teaching as well at universities or something, it's the students often, they think too much about the final outcome and you're always, worried about it and I remember me being like that on PA as well but you have to really be honest to what you want to do and if you don't feel like what you're doing is the right way of doing it then figure out another way of doing it <laughs> you know like someone would have told me or Helen why are you picking up stuff on the street and why are you like <laughs> making shit out of it and Joey the same but you know we carried on doing it and it's become a huge part of our work now and it's progressed but that was the starting point so there's no like A to B. Well, sometimes it's going against your teachers, isn't it? Totally. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, about lies. I remember you, you, Helen, saying that you uh, you just went off to Imperial College to, to work with the scientists rather than. Um, actually um <laughs> studying accessory design which you weren't meant to be doing sounds great <laughs> i think that was like all of us i think it's always very hard to go through the grain especially when you're doing a fashion degree because obviously you sort of take the lead there but i think it's like what i say to a lot of people like the best designers are the ones who stay true to who they are and I think that's like one of the most important messages from all of us and that, yeah, it doesn't, I, I don't always say to people that sustainability has to be what people actually do as their main focus because I feel like if you're forced into it, it's not something you enjoy and something that can really be pushed into it. But I think you just generally really have to ask yourself what do you want to produce? Because at the end of your degree, your MA, you're the one who's going to be assigned to the job, applying for what you want to do. So I think you have to stick true to who you are and not please other people along the way. And I think that's so, so important. 
and really hard to do as well. Yeah, really hard. <laughs> it's important to add. You know, it's not. It's definitely not easy. This option. Um, but yeah, it's exactly as you said. You have, you have to kind of find your your own path because at the end of the day, now I'm here in my house every day. Can't go to the studio, but I'm the I'm the one that has to drive my business. And if I don't do it, then no one else is going to do it. So you have to believe in what you're doing. Yeah, it's not about pleasing somebody else. It's about pleasing yourself. Well, yourself, yeah. So, same truth. Can I just add, like, my experience of going through, like, uh, do my MA at the RCA, and because I'm so process based, it was very difficult for them to like understand what I was doing in the same way that you guys are describing. Because if you're open ended and you're looking for sort of like the unknown, it's very hard to express that in a tutorial when they want to see your finished object when you almost when it seems like when you started and I think that's what was so lovely to like work with Matthew who's working the same way with other accessory people that that's so rare and that's so special I think it just goes to show that when you sort of put your minds together because I knew that all these guys had amazing processes and amazing like minds and ways of thinking about the world because, I mean, my work's all about anthropology and about people, and that's my biggest fascination. But it's also the biggest connection that we all have. And, you know, and we all talk about this all the time. And I think bringing us all together just made this whole project so it's just really strong, you know. And being able to sort of talk about it through different mediums as well. Matt, do we want to take some questions now? I mean, there are not many uh, on uh, the chat, but I don't know if anyone wants to bring a question to the, to the panel. Uh, so far, I had a question which was really about the shoes. They wanted to know a bit more about how you make your shoes. Uh, do you sew them? Do you, do you glue them? What's the longevity of them? That's for Ellen. And then there was a question which was more on the side of fashion revolution. We wanted to know a little bit more about uh, your, eventually if there's any program to follow up in your sort of collective idea, if there is any sort of plans to make this more stable and long-term. Okay, shall I go first with the okay. shoes? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think um, just a little bit more about my background, obviously I studied um, footwear BA at, at Northampton and then I went on to do my MA footwear RCA so obviously I had um, a footwear knowledge knowledge of making I worked within factories as well when I was in Northampton so I had um, I started off with a very traditional knowledge of making how to make a shoe you know make brogues make formal shoes um, and then when I went to RCA I kind of flipped that on its head and started Kind of almost deconstructing shoes and looking at how to unmake them in a way so um, with this collection it really was kind of a process of both and that's also how I do my bespoke um, work so it's about creating the pattern and you know around the last as you do when you create any shoe um, but also looking at the shoe that I already had that existed so the Vibram five fingers we needed to keep the sole as it was so I was looking at can I combine the sole and the upper in a way where I'm not um, taking apart all those little toes? Um, so I ended up finding a process where I could actually stitch the two pieces together on the cylinder arm. So they're actually not glued together at all. They're just um, essentially taken apart and then stitched back together again, like a repairing stitch almost all the way around, which um, combines the two pieces back together again. So um, it's kind of, one of those things where once you get into the process, again, when working with Matthew, you know, we didn't really know what the shoes were gonna look like for quite a long time. <laughs> um, until, you know, and I kept saying to you, yeah, I'm just working out the pattern. I'm just working <laughs> out the pattern. <laughs> Every time you asked me to see a shoe, I was like, sorry, I haven't worked out that. Um, so, you know, that took quite a lot of working out, but once once we had that, then, then that's how we could um, stitch them together. So they're all stitched, uh, those ones. I hope that answers yeah, it. Like I've worn them as well. They they're great. They're really comfy. Oh, no, you wore them the night of the show, and then we were in the park. Yeah, we were, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
There is another question, um, basically, about, I think it's, um, Mona is asking about dead stock places that you could recommend. Um, she's saying, I try to, I try some, but it seems difficult in this time. I'm doing my MA in fashion right now. Try to work with my own uh, means. So if there is any suggestion there to help her finding place where to source, I mean, it's not clear what material are you looking for? Because I mean, here with the sort of discussion that we have, we had, there is a quite wide variety of materials. So maybe if you could be more specific on what you're looking for, they might be able to help. Mona? But I think just um, in general as a starting point, especially as um, Mona said at the moment, you know, we're all stuck at home. So if there is, you know, try and find some inspiration from the things around you. Do Is there household materials that you can utilize? Do you have, um, you know, clothes in your wardrobe, bed sheets, pillowcases, whatever, like those sort of pieces around you that you can actually start to utilize to just to at least to prototype or start working. Um, it's always a good way to start um, just to get the process going would be my first thoughts. And she just says, um, I'm looking for sustainable fabrics and just offcuts a designer, perhaps, designers perhaps. I'm trying to utilize some bed sheets, for example, to do natural dyeing. Um, I would say that if you're buying uh, sustainable fabrics from new, um, so for this collection, the only, well, the new fabric that I would use was um, an organic uh, cottons, or organic jerseys um, from the organic textile company. Um, a really really nice company but it was the, the only thing that i'd ever really bought new um but if you're gonna i would just contact designers like look for emails if you have them some of them have them on their websites um it might not be the best time right now considering the climate uh, with covid and everything but um yeah i mean a lot of designers have um, surplus materials in storages and things like that especially the bigger brands and also, I'd really encourage um, people, especially students and stuff, to, uh, like Matthew said, to reach out to people because um, I think sometimes there's kind of almost like a barrier put up that we're so, um, you know, uncontactable. But, you know, these days it's so easy to contact someone, to slide into someone's DMs, to build a relationship with someone. And I think that, um, you know, it's now, if any, it's the time all trying to connect with each other so it's a really good time to really start finding putting your feelings out seeing what you can find even if you can't actually source the material you can at least maybe build some relationships i think also just sort of like adding in there is like sort of like what matthew's done in sort of this is like supporting other fellow designers and not always just like even when I first started out, I remember sort of like reaching out firstly to all the big houses and everything like that. But there's so many other sort of startups, so many people, especially like even sort of pushing bio design here, like so many people starting with bioplastics, upcycling materials and everything like that. And I think actually just researching online for startups, people who, like on Instagram, people who are making their own sustainable materials, where you can actually see the stories and support people, you'll get a lot more freedom with what type of material you can use and use, but you also see such a vast like types of sustainable material and they're also like a lot easier to approach and a lot easier to work with as well. I think this is gonna happen more and more as well because <clears throat> Phoebe, if you look what Phoebe English did with her collection, um, in uh the, in september um she just asked she wanted to um uh source it within london so that there was uh, travel was uh, cut down and she just asked um a lot of um independent um designers within london whether they donate their extra uh their leftovers and they did um and everybody was very proud to do that and to say that so i think yeah smaller people at, it's actually becoming now a kind of badge of pride to be able to say you've, you've shared. So, yeah, use Instagram at the end. Yeah, and also, like, following on from that, I think that's something that's so important about this general 
platform kind of the movement that we're we're moving in now and like what Matthew's demonstrated with this collection that you know five years ago like even when I graduated it was very one person against the next person you know you have to you're all in competition with each other Alice I remember even when you graduated I was like oh no another shoe person <laughs> but like then you realize that if you can actually work together and you can build each other up and strengthen each other together, then you become so much more powerful, especially against these big industry players. And that's, you know, the way that we can, we can work together. So I think exactly as Sarah said, there's kind of like a pride in, in working with each other that never really used to exist in fashion. So it's definitely a great time to be doing it. I think that was like the one as well, because we're all friends, you know, it, maybe not in the beginning, but we're all friends now. So it's like, um, you know, I can ask you a question about work or I can, you know, ask Joe something or it, it's about giving advice to each other as well at the same time, you know, and learning from mistakes and looking out for one another, you know, or did this person contact you or you know, whatever, just, just so we, we know that we're sort of fighting for the right things and the same, you know. Sorry, I, I keep going in and out, so I don't know if I'm missing things. Are there any more questions? So basically, we, we have a couple of questions on the feed on YouTube. So one is from Neem at Fashion Revolution. So I wonder who is out there whose work you really admire and follow that, and follow that uh, not working in fashion, uh, but in other fields, scientists or other types of design? Um, I've got one. I've got one. You've got one as well. Do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah. go first Joe? No, you go first. Oh, that's... All right. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a, a woman called Brooke Gal. Um, she did ceramics at St. Martin's and I met her when I was doing my BA. And we actually made shoes together, which is funny, but she developed this um, natural water filter um, and this natural, it, she imitated the natural water filtration process. And at that time, I was so fascinated by food and agriculture and water and everything we put inside our body, and, like how we've curated the world. And um, she also had that interest. And I think the work that she does is amazing. She's developing sort of more commercial products now, I think, but... Uh, at that time, the material um, that she developed had compost of like charcoal and volcanic rock and we'd made shoe soles. So my crazy idea was that you could walk uh, along like the, you know, the streets or in nature and you'd collect this water that would filter with these shoes <laughs> in order to drink. It was really far out. Um, but yeah, many other things, but she makes really beautiful clothes and jars and things like that. And, um, works with scientists and labs and it, it's fascinating that she can imitate um, sort of the mineral compounds of water from different parts of the world. It's so interesting. Can you just say her name again, Matthew? Her name is Brooke Scal. I'll put it in the chat. I have to admit that one of my sort of like favorite people is um, Neri Oxman who is, um, she is a bioscientist from MIT in America, and she does biomimicry where she 3D prints death masks using the mimicry of um, biology and 3D prints it and creates these, like, the most beautiful, amazing ancient masks, which I like, Neri Oxman, I highly recommend people to see it and it was sort of the beginning of bio design I think almost five years five six years ago now but she's been like one of my main influences in like 3d printing with bio and like the idea of using biology with technology mine was one of my early influences was Thomas Heatherwick and it kind of like it comes back to like material and process again and kind of like how he works with those and like how he'll he'll find something maybe in material or process and like shelve it because it's a solution for something he doesn't know 
what it is for and kind of like building up like that kind of understanding of mater again materiality um and solutions to things but you you don't know what the problem is and you build up a bank of like knowledge and it's very kind of like i always go back to that as kind of like in the way that i work i'm building up sort of like my knowledge of like things but you sometimes they do get shelved and you don't know what they're for and kind of i find that fascinating and it's kind of like it's it's about sort of like the integrity of building things with, with materials mm -hmm. does that make sense I think for me, one that I always go back to um, that's a bit of a random reference is Rachel White Reed. I think for me, her work really sums up a lot of things that I'm also trying to do, but obviously she's working with these sculptures, she's working with um, cement, but she's you know, kind of really cr encasing these memories of these products and these buildings through her, through her work. And it almost, her work is like, telling so many stories of a product, but the product isn't actually there. And I think those sort of ideas, um, I don't know, I just always go back to that. I always flick through one of her books if I get stuck and print out a picture of a cement bathtub and then I know what to do. <laughs> I actually have one more. Do you have time for one more? Um, one of my favorite artists is Olaf Eliasson. And I know he had an exhibition at the Tate quite recently as well. I just find um, the way that he talks about real environmental issues through his pieces that um, viewers can participate in and feel emotion from is just amazing because it's learning about something that's very important but in a very immersive way um, that might engage more people than if you just speak about it. I think it's, what he does is amazing as well. Okay, Matthew, do you want to wrap up with everybody? And uh, I think we now are like 15 minutes over time, which is absolutely fine. Oh. But... <laughs> so who wants to take the closing two minutes? Sarah? Oh, well, thank you. Um... <clears throat> Um, I just want to say thank you, Matthew. Um, in all the time I've known you, you've been working in the most extraordinary and generous way um, with Disco Make, with um, uh, uh, Fashion Revolution, um, always bringing people together. Um, and I think you know what we've what we've learned from today is about principle, about exploration about freedom of thinking, um, about integrity and, and also about emotion. And I think that kind of joins all of you together. And um, I'm just so excited to see how you're all leading at the forefront of a generation where collaboration is going to mean um, everything, community, localism and exploring exploring what we already have and making something beautiful. So congratulations to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I just say thank you to all of the guys as well. I've just loved working with all of you and it's just been amazing because it just brought us all together so much. Um, yeah, and it's been a great experience. Thank you. We love you. We love you. <laughs> thank you. Everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.